again uh, welcome uh, back to algo trading week day 4 and uh, today is september 27 and uh, it's our 11th anniversary uh, we started small 11 years ago and now we are catering to more than a million people across more than 200 plus countries and territories through our educational initiatives every year uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the love and continuous support of our fast growing community and uh, we have produced some of the most sought after courses in collaboration with leading industry experts and today i'm happy to announce that uh, we are launching our second certification program after epat uh, and that is certification in sentiment analysis and alternative data in finance csaf now about this csaf program okay so it is designed for professionals in financial markets who are looking to develop their career with the help of modern methods using news sentiment analysis and alternative data this program covers various aspects like uh, uh, covers various aspects of news analytics sentiment analysis alternative data that is required to you know for for trading and investment decision making in the competitive world of finance and this instructor led course is comprehensive and offers unparalleled insights into the course of algorithm and latest thinking in the financial technology if i talk about people who are going to conduct this okay now this course is designed by leading algorithmic traders sentiment pundits quantitative modeling experts and hft thought leaders and in today's session we have invited some of these faculty members so we will be joined by dr cristiano arbexwali who is researcher and developer at optimist system will be also be joined by professor gautam mitra who is founder and md of optimist systems then dr matteo campiloni who is going to be uh, joining us who is executive chairman at brain and the last one is dr ravi kashyap who is quantitative strategist and vice president at morgan stanley will be joining us so professor mitra will be the moderator for today's panel and uh, let's start with today's session straight away so professor mitra over to you okay thank you very much and i would request uh, Ravi and Cristiano to turn on their camera. And if you give me control, I want to have a quick share of my screen. Sure, Professor. I am just going to pass the. Okay, you can share your screen now. And show my screen. So, uh, thank you, everybody who has come here to listen to us. Hi screen is is my screen visible yes yes professor we can see all of it okay just a minute i've got it uh, uh one minute uh for some reason the camera the, uh how do i make it smaller uh everyone in short i mean going to make it shorter just take your mount, mouse pointer at the border and it will allow you to do that oh, for some reason it's not doing uh okay i just okay okay i've been lecturing so long but when it comes to this we're getting it ah that's better it's moving okay that's yeah. out of the way good yeah so Mean, yeah meanwhile i just wanted to highlight uh, with, to everyone that this is going to be a panel discussion and uh, please make sure that whatever questions you have however questions you have just put in the questions panel and uh, we'll try to make sure that uh, we can answer as many questions as possible in today's session professor mitra over to you Prof, we can't hear you. You are in mute, I guess. 
Yeah, so it is about sentiment and alternative data in finance. Um, it could, we're going to talk about what, why, and how, meaning what is alternative data, why we need it, and how we can unlock its value. By that, I mean each of our panelists, uh, two of them were regular faculty and two are guest faculty who give us, uh, if you like, case studies, are going to describe or answer those questions. They'll each will spend uh, one minute in introducing themselves briefly, then two odd minutes or less to answer why and how. And so how, that detects your why and how. But what we actually can give you through a handbook that we are preparing on alternative data, and will come out in spring 2022, like the other one, other two cohorts, which we deal with batch one and batch two, we gave them the handbook for free that we had in sentiment analysis. And this, you will get a preview until it's ready in spring 2022, people starting in November, to get a copy of it. Uh, so after 20 and 25 minutes, panel takes questions from the winner and the attendees. So be ready with your questions and then please. So we start and going in the alpha order with the following attendees, if you like. Now, we start with uh, 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 <clears throat> Cristiano. So can you give one minute on about yourself and two minutes or less on the topic of why alternative data is useful and how it can unlock its value? I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing, okay. oh, no, I'll, I'll keep sharing screen. Yeah. You can, uh, you can turn your camera on and, oh, yeah, you have it on, but you can yeah, see. Yeah, can you hear me well? Yes. If, if it's a, yeah, if it's a bit noisy, please let me know. I can change rooms because there's a, a little emergency here. There's a person working at home. That's why I'm wearing a mask, okay? Uh, if it's noisy, please let me know. But uh, I am, my name, like Professor Mito said, my name is Cristiano. I, I've been working with Optrivis since 2010. Okay, I also work uh, a lecturer at a university here in Brazil, where I'm from. Okay, it's a federal university of Minas Gerais in, in, in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And I've been working, uh, uh, my background is computer science, but I've been working with mostly optimization and mathematical modeling, especially related to finance. Uh, also together with Optrivis, where we have developed several uh, technologies uh on this uh area of applied finance okay trading and finance uh i've been participating on the uh quantum courses for sentiment and that in alternative data the last two uh events right i have given especially the parts several of the hands-on lectures where we built together uh, uh notebooks in python uh, exploring in a uh working with sentiment data all right and uh, why i consider sentiment data to be important basically uh, in finance uh, we we all know that predicting the future is a is the most difficult task one can try right when attempting to predict the future uh, because we cannot account for for what's going to happen in the future we don't know what's going to happen we know that assets are influenced all the time by by news events uh, so uh, it's a, it's it gets to a matter of who reacts the fastest to, to when a news events happen we all the only thing we know for sure is that news events are going to affect prices of assets tomorrow but we don't know how and which news events they may be on scale they schedule and uh, uh, the sentiment data is uh, the idea behind sentiment data is to as fast as possible to process the news as soon as they are published and have it uh, automatically converted into a numerical sentiment and so that we can build mathematical models which uh, take, uh, which use this data as input to maybe have more informed conclusions or informed uh, decision making regarding what's going to happen with uh, one asset or a group of assets or anything. So it's a, it's a different source of data that is uh, not captured by using, employing market data as usual, okay? 
uh, and how you know, the suggested method and models to unlock values. We have worked for the past years with several possible models on how we can use news analytics to, uh, to improve the results of models. For example, uh, we have achieved some in very interesting results when trying to predict asset, vol asset volatility in the future, uh, improving current prediction models of asset volatility by using new sentiment as an extra input feature. Okay. Uh, and we have found uh, interesting results and improvements. And we have some papers published in the area uh, with how we can employ this in models such that we get at least uh, in, uh, in our results improved prediction, uh, especially regarding volatility. And we have several other ways where we research on how to explore news analytics to better improve our prediction or decision making models. Yeah. Well, I think, in my opinion, it's a very interesting area, full of uh, research right. opportunities. We'll give the attendees some chance. Shall we move on to... Okay, yes. so if I go in that order, I come next. I could do that, and then comes uh, Matteo and then Jovi, okay? So I want to give a very short introduction myself. I actually, I'm not going to say that, anything, because it's in the text that is for the webinar. So I just lead uh, of three systems. That's about it. And I'm now fully committed to our company's financial analytics. Now, why and how is very interesting. For the last 10 years, we have been grappling and trying to go from ordinary standard quant finance with market data by trying to integrate news. And so, therefore, we use models. And initially, there were lots of skeptics from other parts of the the finance industry saying, oh, that's really of not much use, until they've now gone fully sold on the idea of news and sentiment. That is, sentiment comes from news as well as various microblogs, Twitter, etc. But by the time we felt comfortable almost there, then we didn't know what hit us. And what really did hit us about two years ago was this whole concept of alternative data. The what alternative data does is to introduce information like uh, telephone calls or mobile phone conversation or your, uh, if you like, uh, uh, invoices of uh, that you, you have in your inbox, which can be shared to the wild public anonymously without your name, and invoices from Amazon or you know uh, people who supply. Uh, pizza, etc., and that actually gives a very good leg up, if you like, an in intro introduction to uh, consumer habits and therefore what happens to companies who are in consumer specific area. So now, question is: so that is why that we have to got into alternative data. It made a big change because everybody else is rushing for. But about how, I want to only put it in the following way. You see, data needs model. You know, data on its own is no good unless its value is unlocked using model. And it gives you, you know, and the sort of things that we want in finance, domain of finance, either risk management, risk quantification, or ex ante asset allocation so that we can make through trading some money. Uh, similarly, models are no good until there is data. So data needs models and models need data. So coupling the two is exactly the way you can do it. And there are many, many different ways you can couple them. I mean, it's not just uh, this finding out what the uh, best strategy to do, but in order to get to the strategy, we have to use AI and machine learning models to predict the market directions. You know. One thing we know, you can't predict market prices or anything. That's pretty tough. But you can predict which way you would go. And that's quite a challenge. Itself is a challenging task, but it uses various AI machine learning models. So with that, I stop and I pass it on to Matteo. OK? No. Professor, hey. just a small request. So uh, we are getting some requests. If we can. Uh, 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 stop sharing this slide so that uh, everyone can see everyone. I think okay. these are the two questions. Right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, we can stop sharing just a minute. How do I do that? Uh, uh, how do I uh, sharing? Oh, here. I've stopped sharing it. Perfect. Right. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Gautam. So, um, a, a brief introduction of myself. Um, I'm founder of Brain. Brain is a company that um, is a research-oriented company, meaning we try to create proprietary algorithms and uh, methods. Uh, we, we try to extract signals uh, on, related to financial markets and uh, list on financial markets. And as some of our, our products are what are considered alternative data sets. So we have a proprietary sentiment indicator, as well as some other um, si uh, signals or data set based on a combination of uh, natural language processing techniques, uh, machine learning based techniques, or anyway, statistical tools. So we develop a platform which combines a number of statistical tools to create, uh, and one of our products are the alternative data sets. So why? One of the questions is why alternative data sets are, are relevant or are interesting uh, for, for invest, uh, asset management company in financial markets. So uh, this is uh, something that, as Gaudam has already pointed out, has been, is a phenomenon which has been growing in the last few years. Uh, my ideas on why is that happening is, first of all, there is always a quest, especially by um, by advanced uh, investors to try to find an edge and, and accept an additional information to have some uh, to, to invest to include in uh, in models either systematic models but not necessarily also discretionary models on financial markets and there is big and uh, there are two phenomena which took place at the same time one is increased availability of data of different sorts of data in additional to financial and economic let's say traditional data uh, of all sources and types, um, and also an increased uh, capacity from a computer point of view, I mean, algorithmic capacity, but also in terms of uh, easily accessible algorithms, tools, and methods, and uh, libraries to process this data. There is a booming of the data science industry, so of course all these combined make it the alternative data ecosystem uh, growing uh, from starting from providers of alternative data sets, like in some sense we are, but we are, our data sets are alternative because they stem from our algorithms. Our alternative data could be very different, like geolocalization and uh, any kind, any source of data. And Gautam has a written, I think, or is writing a handbook on all, all these possibilities. But uh, so from those, but also there is a number of platforms that have increased in, in, in as an aggregator of these data sets and um, uh, re making them available to potential uh, investors and potential users of these data sets. So uh, to the how, um, I mean, the way it is important to have, I think, a rigorous approach and uh, in uh, processing a large number of information, which you can combine is a, in a, like almost an infinite number of ways uh, when you have only one history of financial data. So it is, you know, it is, you, you find your own rules, your way the thing combined work, but then you only can, you cannot repeat the experiment only on the history that has happened. So in doing so, in, in analyze, analyzing the information in this data, certainly it's interesting to try to find um, algorithms and signals or uh, laws somehow in a, in, in, in inverted brackets, I'd say, but it is it's important to understand that the world is changing. That your risk of the risk of overfitting is high because you have a large number of data, and as I, as I said, one of the strategies. So it's important in, in any approach that it is rigorous, but also that you are you ask yourself, you try to assess how generalizable your results are to the future, if any. And so you that, that is important, I think, in in using uh, these additional source of data and, and methods. And now I leave it to Kashyap, who was uh, being yeah, the last. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, 
So thanks, Prof. Mehta. So uh, my name is Ravi Kashyap, and uh, I spent a number of years in the financial industry. And um, I've moved to academia about a uh, few years back. So now I, I'm a professor, and I teach in Singapore, uh, Europe. I also taught in South Korea. Um, so now, uh, looking at the three questions that uh, Professor Mitra had, the what, the, the why, and the how. So I think the what, you're going to get a book very soon, right? But I think to summarize one thing about the what, what is alternative data now will not be alternative data later. And what is mainstream data now was alternative data before. For example, many of us take, like for example, prices from the market, we take it for granted, but that was not available to everybody, very recent past. And so these things will change over time, right? So what is alternative data? In, a, in summary, is something that will give an edge to you right now. And then, you know, other people will copy it, it gets commoditized, and, uh, and then the story goes on. So then going on to the next question, which is um, why alternative data? So now, uh, you know, finance has a reputation of being very complex. But if you ask me, there is only two things, there's only three things you can do in finance. You can buy securities, you can sell securities, or you can hold which is actually not doing anything. So there's only two things you can do in finance. And there's only one goal in finance. You just want to make more money, whatever money you have. You... So now the it's very simple if you look at finance this way. But unfortunately, we don't have a good answer to these two simple questions, when to buy and when to sell. So that is why we are trying to find that edge by being able to predict. And uh, later, if there is time, we'll talk about predictions a little bit and how the data can help. So it is about trying to answer these two questions, when to buy and when to sell. That is why we need uh, data sets. What somebody doesn't have, because at the end of the day, you're competing with everybody else that is doing the same thing. So you need an edge and you try to create something you know, that, that can help you with that. So that brings up the last question, which is um, how? And um, now of the two questions here, what, why, of the three questions, what, why, and how? Now, the most important question is why? Because once we know why we are doing something, we will find a way. So the question how is answered right there. So how do we use alternative data? However we can. And you know, what is it? Whatever, it? whatever it can be, right? So you know, the why will guide these two things and how we use alternative data. People have found some wonderful, wonderful ways to use it. And these are some things you will study in the course. And, you know, the book that Professor Mitra is working on goes into a lot of these data sets. And, you know, this is where I think a little bit of mathematics will help, right? Because we try to use, when you put on the lens of mathematics on any data set, you will find different ways of looking at it. It's like a magnifying glass, right? You see different things. So then that's how, you know, uh, the mathematics parts will help. And uh, I think for this brief introduction, I'll stop here. But uh, later we can, you know, if this time we'll talk about predictions and how data sets are used uh, for that goal. Yeah, back to Professor Mitra. Okay, so let's have the questions from the floor. And our team are going to, you can guide your question to various people. Indeed. Matteo has to leave slightly early, so if you have a special question for Matteo, you can ask them now. Otherwise, you can ask in general question to all panelists, and we'll try to understand, uh, try to answer your questions. So, Kitish, will your team take the questions and show it to us? On uh... sure, bro. So, uh, the first question that uh, that we have, so Piyush asks. Uh, news as a source of data for sentiment analysis is generally biased on the understanding of a presenter. For example, Z Limited plus Sony merger, which created frenzy, and now the investors are stuck. How do we get unbiased data for sentiment analysis? Okay, you want to do, do it, go first, Ravi? Quickly, it should be about quickly. Uh, yeah. So now, you know, in terms of, you know, bias. Now this is a very, very, very vast topic, and that's a great question. Whoever is asking that, right? So to understand, data is just 
think about it as one tool, right? So how we make sure that it's unbiased or not, there are various techniques that we have to look at, right? So, you know, this is where I think people do different sort of back tests to see how the data has performed. If, if that's possible, historically, we try to see how it is performed. Um, and then also the most important part about using any data is we have to look at what are the scenarios under which this data set was collected and what are the scenarios where this will not work right so these are the things that you know any model will not give a simple answer but we can build some sort of um, so this is where i think models this is where i think um, you know ai and those things are coming in because they are where people are trying to build a context around the model and this is this is where you know better algorithms are coming in so having that contextual information trying to provide that no and models by themselves cannot do it it has to be constructed around that so doing that uh, i think providing that contextual information uh, is is i think the key thing and this is the challenge it's yeah, not yeah, done yeah. but that's what Absolutely. people are doing. yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'd like to make one short comment and that is bias is actually in the domain of behavioral finance you know to relocate bias itself is a big topic and we'll be teaching a bit of that, but you know, okay, by saying that there was bias, it may or may not be true. So the merger, like of the type you said, do happen. You know, there are GameStop and other things that, you know, similarly are behavioral aspects, how people have a hard instinct and so forth. So with this short comment, I'm going to pass on to Matteo and then Cristiano. Yeah, uh, just one quick comment. It, I think that. It also depends a lot on what you what you need the news or the sentiment for. I mean, if you want to assess is that news flow in absolute term positive or negative, then you might consider the question of the bias. If you want to use it to com to create some some sort of strategy, either systematic or not, I think it's more important that you have like sort of a, a frozen algorithm to calculate to score the news rather than i mean if there is a, a bias in, uh, in it's probably more relative to, un, to understood to be understood in relative terms so if it's an increase or decrease but where you set the zero it's very difficult to to set an exact zero what is the news at, at sentiment zero so the question of the bias if it is for creating to, uh, uh, to understand if a sentiment is more positive than yesterday or or in a similar similar situation of two years ago, then it's I think it's relevant that the algorithm with which you score the news is the same rather than you set exactly an unbiased algorithm. Oh, Cristiano, this way. Can we then go on to the next question when he comes I'm, back? I'm, yeah. Sure. Yes, sure, yeah. Hi. I just change the room. Yeah. Uh, Beauty on, on what Ravi said. Uh, no, the you. I think you, you cannot really control the the data source. Like the, the data that that you have access to is published by by a third party, and it may be biased, it may be unbiased. It's not very clear whether that's going to be true or not. But exploring it with models, understanding, and we, we take the data and we try to do our best to understand how to work with that data. So uh, I, I, it's it's an interesting question because of course you may conclude that that data is biased and and maybe has no value. Or we can use it even if it's biased. Or so it, it really it depends on the data source, and that we can control. What we can control is how we're going to work with that data, right? But anyway. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, Professor Mizra, I just wanted to add one thing, uh, which uh, we have to have know, next question. Now. We can't yeah, be just about the bias. Um, yeah. Just, just to finish off, and you know, as they say, you know, a good answer only you think about it later, right? You know, so um, see. There's a there's a recent paper that I was uh, working on and it just came out. The title of the paper is Behavioral Bias Benefits. So when you say bias is not always a negative thing, you know you can benefit from other people's biases. So if you think if you have remember we talked about constructing a context for the model. So if you think other people are going to be biased, you can benefit from that. So there is that thing that possibility as well. Yeah. So but again the key is about constructing the context around the model. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Shall we move to other questions, Kitish? 
How many more questions have we got? Because we'll, we we have got so many questions. Sorry, go on, Kirish. Yeah. So the next question is by Divakar. So Divakar asks, what are the parameters to look for sentiment? Oof. Uh, um. Yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the question. What the parameters? Yeah, neither do I. I mean, parameters. Yeah. I mean, okay, news providers or sentiment data providers classify them as positive, neutral, or negative. And I think most people work from there. And there are other, like Matteo's company, who themselves classify it, but it should be more or less in the three uh, steps, if without three categories. So what to look for is quite different because if the implication is that it's positive news and it might go up, that itself can be, of course, exploited in the long strategy. But the fact that it signals is going down can be also exploited because people wanting to make it also do shorting. Or so, so as a result, and or if it is neither good or bad than flat, then it might want to do not not take no position. So given that, I I don't believe uh, we are looked to in order to try to find out uh, parameters is the most important thing. But uh, let me pass it on to my colleagues again. Uh, let's first of all go to Matteo and then. Uh, okay, hello. So I, I am I'm also not sure if I understand the question, but if the question is what kind of information you might expect to find in a sentiment data set, and I'm not sure that's the question. If that so rather the features that you might expect then it depends really on on the provider, but typical uh typical information are a number that scores the news, so it can be either coming from a sort of classification like Gautam was saying positive negative or neutral uh, or you can have a continuous number or almost continuous number like minus one to plus one if it's very positive and so on so anyway it's a number that scores the piece of news or also you there you could find typically the volume of news or something related to how many news have been published on that stock to see if there is any or, or any asset to see <coughs> interest or decrease in interest. So the, uh, this, or you can renormalize this volume by the average volume that it has been having over a certain time period. So it depends really on the data sets, but typically in the news flow, the informations are the scoring somehow the news flow and the measurement of how strong the interest is on those uh, news for, uh, uh, on those um, news. Some, pro some other um, providers, uh, we might focus also on the sources. That is something we do not do, but it could be interesting do, to do. So it depends. Typically, when you talk about sentiment, the first thing is trying to score the the positiveness of negativeness of the of the news on that single asset. I think I probably slightly quick one before uh, Ravi and Christian uh, understanding a bit about the question of feature. I mean, it's not uh, and as, as you mentioned, Matteo, about news flow. It's not just about the positive or negative. It's also the volume of news. Meaning volume of news also in, 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 uh, more or less uh, affects the market as much as volume of trade does. So, uh, so there are different features. And in various predictive models, volume itself is a feature or from a logistic regression model there. Over, over to you, Ravi. Good. Uh, thank you for some so uh, I think you know uh, you know my colleagues have given some wonderful points. So the one thing uh, to add to that is let's look at an example, right? Let's take Twitter as an example. Right? This is something. Uh, so in my last job in the industry, one of the data sets we act actively tried to monetize was using Twitter data. So in Twitter, what it does is it looks through all the tweets and then it picks the keyword. So, which is also, I think, what Matthias was saying. From the news, you look at it. But in Twitter, we have an extra element. So now that can be what you said is the parameter. So who is saying something? So what uh, this algorithm was doing was it was qualifying certain accounts as 
you know, the key movers. So in the financial markets, we call them elephants, whales, whatever, right? Because they have an outsized impact. So now, how often is somebody saying something, but who is also saying it? So these become two parameters. And really, just starting with these two, when you look at it for a historical period, you get a lot of, you know, oh, how many people are talking about it? And uh, how important are those people? So then with that, uh, it gives you sentiment. Now, one other thing to consider here is, now sentiment is, is a very language specific thing. So now this is where I think, you know, a lot of, um, they, what do they, they call it something in AI, you know, machine, it's not, yeah, it's um, language, you know, they, there is some word in AI for that, you know, um, so where they're trying to parse language, right? And to make sure that machines can read it and to understand what is meant by that. So now these are being used because sentiment is a very specific, because, you know, we're not able to look at expressions, right? We are looking at text only. So expressions, looking at videos and other things, that'll come later. But right now we're just looking at text and we're trying to take the word and its meaning in the context, right? So, okay. uh, and this is where I think AI techniques are being used. Yeah. Christian, quickly. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ravi and Mateo. I, uh, I'll complement on what they both said. Uh, two other possible information that uh, source piece of information that you can extract from uh, news from from sentiment data are uh, one news event uh, may influence a series of companies, a series of different assets. So you might want to to define which assets are being influenced by this specific news event. So one uh, common feature of uh, uh, data providers, uh, news data providers, is a relevance. You can classify whether that, uh, for example, an event may be specifically about a certain company, but may uh, marginally uh, impact other companies, for example, in the same sector. So you can classify uh, a relevance uh, according to a certain uh, number of entities, entities being companies or sectors of the market or countries even, uh, and you can also uh, uh, exploit the novelty of the news event because news come uh, and news are published multiple times and follow up on news events. Uh, so you might also want to, to classify how novel that news is as we believe that a, 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 an original news event is more likely to cause impact than a repeated, uh, something that the market already knows. So all this information together can be used uh, with what Matteo said, with what Ravi mentioned, uh, including volume that Professor Mita mentioned, can be uh, built in together into a, into a single prediction model. I mean, as we, the, the best way we can do it, the best we can do with that. That's it. Absolutely, thank you very much. Hitish, the next question. So the next question is uh, very much on the similar lines. So uh, Vadim asks, what is the relative share of alternative data streams, textual versus numeric, in terms of time spent on collection and processing? Could you repeat the last bit? What is the? Yeah. So. Yeah. What is the share of alternative data stream? So basically share of textual versus numerical data in terms of time spent on collecting that and processing that and converting into some sentiment uh, indicator. I think it's, it's how fast from, from publication to having the sentiment read in our model. Is it the latency necessary to... Uh, uh, usually, uh, I mean, I can only speak for gen general data providers. Perhaps Matteo can also complement on it. But uh, usually companies, uh, they have a subscription to, to news content providers or alternative data uh, providers in which they get uh, via an application programming interface, they an API uh, and run the algorithms. The algorithms have already been previously trained and they have machines, so they only have to, to uh, classify the news events uh, and deliver it to the customer. So we expect it to be a matter of uh, at most a few seconds. It's what I would expect, although I don't personally work in a, in a provider like that. I would personally expect no more than a few seconds between, pub, uh, we, we may even get the, the, the data before actual uh, publication, if you have a, a subscription with the news content provider. So I'll, I'll pass the word to, to the others. Yeah, Matteo? Okay, so again, it, the the question is, uh, how long does it take to process news? Is that is that correct, more or less? Because 
I could infer the question for what Cristiano was answering, but I could not really understand the question. So if the yeah, I'm, not, if, I'm not entirely sure too, but I inferred it. Yes. Okay, so if that's the cor correct, uh, it, it depends on what you want to do again. And so in our case, we create a sentiment indicator which is not aimed at trying to beat the uh, the the flow the the the, the speed of the way uh, the news reaches the market. So it's not thought for like people who try to uh, gain in uh, being faster. We're trying to create an, a data set, our, but that's a specific methodological choice and there is no good or bad and just, um, so in our case, we're trying to provide a descriptive indicator of how the news flow is going on a single asset. So in fact, it is, first of all, the time frame, the minimum time frame is daily, so it's not seconds, because we aggregate the, the, all the news that you have for a single asset over a rolling window of, seven days or 30 days even so depending on the on the data set that you want that you want the time frame that you want to be looking at in the news flow so it's an aggregator of news imagine that the the, the the sentiment then scores gives you a scoring for all the stocks that you're looking so in that case if um if you want, would like to instead to do something daily you might have holes for small stocks who didn't have like a news item in the last 24 hours or Cristiano was probably hinting at looking at specific uh, react something that reacted to each specific news item happening, and that's that's a different thing. So in the way, so so typically what what we I mean what we do is we buy the news flow from aggregators of sources that integrate thousands of sources, and then we score them every day uh, based on the last seven day collection and aggregation. But I, I'm not sure about you can do it you can do many different things so this is one one possible yeah. choice yeah. let let me come in at this point you see the world of trading and fund rebalancing can be categorized as being intra day or high frequency or daily trading or rebalancing in seven days or for fifth you know month or something and people do a lot of this quant funds and hedge funds and others now, there's a distinction between algorithmic trading as it's known, which is usually high frequency trading, meaning intraday, and then you have different frequencies, or systematic trading, which you do systematically, still use models to decide what to do. Now, I think the domain of high frequency trading is not affected by news. That's my thing is intraday, high frequency trading, if you try to, I have not seen many papers which try to do that. However, from systematic trading or fund rebalancing, as Matteo was talking about monthly and so forth, there the speed is less important than the quantity or quality of value that came from the earlier questions is derived. So that's my answer to that particular question about speed. So, Javi. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so, you know, there was um, also a question about, you know, text and numbers, right? And, um, you know, relative proportion. So, the one thing that we need to understand, at the end of the day, all of it is a number. It's all numbers, right? So, the computer only understands numbers. So, everything is being done as numbers. So, now, if that is what the story is, then from text to go to numbers, the conversion. So, there is always an extra layer. So, whenever we work with text, we had to put extra time so to collect it and more importantly to process it and to make sense of it so that always happens now um, in terms of um, you know some of the other uh, points that came up these are very interesting in terms of who is using it and what is their you know use case right so if somebody as uh, professor mitra was saying if you're trying to use something like say you're dip, you're trading 100 times a day then you want to make sure that you're not having such roadblocks where you're waiting for the text to be processed so you know you don't want to build a system like that you don't want to have those kind of dependencies so then you would you know adjust that accordingly but as professor mitra said the quality and the and the time so that's that's very important you know when you're when you're looking at these things and text always you know it's a little bit harder because we have to make get meaning out of it. So that takes extra time. So we just have to account for that. 
Okay, shall we go to the next question? Yes, so the next question is uh, by Siddesh. He asks, uh, in your experience, how many days worth of sentiment data is relevant? For what? So, yeah, I think Rele I'll get... uh, yeah. relevant to what? To create, uh, I mean, it really depends. I'm sorry to break in like this, but. <laughs> no, but you're right. Okay, okay. you right. Relevant to do what? Exactly. Do what? Is it back test or is it virtual trade or actual trading? That's what you want to ask here. Yeah, yeah I, I would say, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I think I understood the question is how far back can, should we go and yeah. still bring value to a model? For example, uh, it's uh, uh, one, uh, news from one week ago. Should we still be using it today or should we stop two, three days? I mean, I might be. Yeah, that can be a good interpretation of that question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let, let's ask that uh, questionnaire. Can you give a bit more clarification uh, about how many days? <laughs> uh, I think uh, then this you can uh, if you can share uh, uh, more detail about the questions. I think we can pick that later. Okay, so yeah. for the, in that okay, case, we'll we'll next question. Next yeah yeah let's move on to the next one so the next question is if we are subscribing to an alternative data source what are the performance metrics for it what should be the performance metrics for any alternative data source so um, the simple answer you know which i mentioned in the beginning how much profit are you making right how much are you paying how much profit are you making that's a simple answer but these are very good questions to think about yeah and, yeah uh, other than the simple answer, the one thing we can tell you is this, right? See, when you start using a data set, generally what people do is they do something called as a back test to see, okay, you know, is there anything, is there any use at all in it before subscribing to this, for example. So in my last job in the industry, we used to provide signals to hedge funds and other, um, you know, trading uh, firms. So we would give them three years of historical data which they would backtest. And then they would decide, okay, is there anything useful or not for me, right? So that one or two or three years data set that we would give to them, they would try a lot of things and see if there is any benefit for it. And if they saw a benefit, then, you know, then there's a negotiation process that goes on and then they decide it. So, uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, generally what people want as much history as possible, um, as cheap as possible, um, but you know, if the data set is relatively new, people will pay a higher amount. And if a lot of people are using it, it becomes cheaper. That data set becomes cheaper because you know it is getting commoditized. People are other people trading from the same data set. So these are some factors to to look at. Um, you know, when you're subscribing to a data set. Yeah. Can I can I add a comment to this? You know, I. Yeah. I agree with uh, what has been said. I just would like to just point out another another point of view is that especially, I mean, the thing I was saying before that you have like the history is not going to repeat itself, not only because it's one possible trajectory, but also because the underlying world always changes. But this is in particular true with the alternative data because like five years ago, people were not using that data and now they might be using it. So any edge that you might have or have had in the past necessarily is is the is uh, the same now. So in the 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 thing that is so I mean asset managers have been used to uh, ask for a long time series to to back test and to have like possibilities also of dissecting the space and creating uh, different scenarios by combinations and so on because by having as many data as possible. Now it can make sense, but it also has to be understood that the, um, especially on, on this new data, uh, it is different to understand how valuable they are now by looking at how valuable they were four years ago and maybe seven years ago that even even existed as a data set. Even the number of sources changes and uh, the way they are. Uh, so it, the thing is a little bit more difficult and even more difficult to make claims on uh, how valid they are. It is maybe it could also make more sense to try to understand it 
with a shorter confidence, with a shorter, so, uh, uh, right, knowing that there is a shorter statistic, a, a less statistical confidence, a, a meaningfulness, but trying to understand now this is working, okay, <laughs> for the moment, because uh, rather than you know, hoping to have a 10 years back test of a data that has been born three years ago. But of course, then of, everyone wants more data to do possible analysis. Yeah. yeah, I would say in alternative data, there is a sparsity of historical information. It's quite difficult. You all the suppliers admit it. However, that may not necessarily stop you from backtesting because there are ways, statistical models whereby you can try to extrapolate back, if you like, or somehow create so, so that you can look at what some plausible answers to long backtests, which really is important because one of the reasons long backtests are important is because get through the in different markets, different regimes. I mean, markets have gone up and down, and strategies work in one market may not, or market regime may not work in another one. So anyway, uh, over to you, Cristiano, and then we move on. Okay, actually, I don't have much to say. I think uh, the answer given was very complete, taking all three of you. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I emphasize the importance of uh, backtesting, comparing how what can you do with that data source and what the best you do without that data source. And that would be the way to, to try to put some value into the data source itself, right? Yeah. But I think that the, the answer given by Matteo Ravi covers it. Yeah. In, in any case, I want to say on this kind of subject, it's very difficult to make strong claims. So they're like, we are on the edge of like personal opinions <laughs> rather than because it's, uh, I mean, you have tools for backtesting and providing measures. And also Cristiano was saying, you can just provide a delta on what would have been your backtest without that data set. But that, then it's only a measure of what would have happened. So it's very difficult to push it beyond and make a, a statement. Okay, next question, Kitish. So we have got a confirmation from Siddesh. So he is saying that Cristiano uh, uh, interpreted it properly, correctly. So his question is, uh, how many days of sentiment do you look back while calculating signals for trading? So basically predicting the market movement. Uh, I, I, maybe I can say a bit on that. Uh, I think, it's it's really a, uh, difficult to also give a definitive answer because it depends on what model you're using. Uh, you can think, okay, uh, I'm thinking of news events and news events, they don't impact uh, companies after a while. But the rolling uh, the rolling movement of news events, news flows, how, how sentiment is varying over time, this can influence. So uh, past data may, in, together with new data may bring value in a prediction now. So how is sentiment changing? Not, not only that uh, a very impactful news event, positive, just came out, but there has been a, 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 histo a recent history of bad news event, and then suddenly the, the mood changed to a, to a positive one. So uh, how to use the news data and how far you go back? We, I, I wouldn't have a definitive answer to that. I would just say uh, it really depends on what sort of model are you using and how are you employing that data in your model. So, uh, that, that's it. So, that's the word to the next person. <coughs> I don't think we have much to add, uh, <coughs> Matteo and Ravi. <coughs> Matteo. No, not really. I mean, it, it, the, yeah. it's again, so it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit advanced. Sorry, sorry, no. I, I, I'd rather leave it to you. Yeah. No, no. Sorry, you're right. I thought I interrupted you. No, so, go ahead. Want to say yeah so he, here is the thing with uh, sentiments right and uh, you know a lot of this we covered in our previous questions also right it depends on see for example you want to put a position for the next one one year if you look at the last five minutes of data that's probably not going to be enough right so that should a ballpark is you should look at the at least the last three years to see what happened right so if you want to trade for the next one day at least look at a few you know few few weeks if not right so and as uh, professor mitra was saying the main problem with alternative data remember as we also spoke in the beginning alternative data 
the best way to think about it is is new data that is being discovered which means there is not much of it so that is the the real problem so you have to tailor your trading trading strategies accordingly and generally you know you have to use whatever data is available and and again look you know it's about if you get 5 years worth of data you know take it and you don't have to use all of it right look at the last 3 years and that's okay too right but generally the, if you look at different historical periods you will get a better better idea so that's always a thing but if you're looking at a certain time interval you should at least look a rule of the thumb i mean again i'll make this up number 7 is a wonderful number right so so let's say at least seven times that that time interval it should be you know because it will give you some idea about what are the different things that can happen so that's that's what i would uh, say yeah. i hope that answers the question so the next question is uh, by kenil so he asks what possibly can be the good source of alternative data so let me we we have actually come across some information in this domain uh there is a very good book and i'm not going to promote that but uh well, i'm promoting by uh said amen and uh, alexander Deneb. they will also be contributing our handbook and they make a point that ultimately we probably will read a data scout somebody who looks at various sources of data finds who are supplying that's within the organization to have a data scout who will be getting looking at various alternative data to the requirement for the quant team and make it available so looking or collecting the information of where to get the data is an important area and it's actually it should be driven by the quant or ai ml team so that and then somebody goes out because the time taken to get that is very big you know it's not that easy because you have child data and then historical data of alternative data and so forth so that's a comment i would make but i would then want to pass it on to regular same order for me it is uh, uh cristiano should come first and then rovi and then matteo and rovi cristiano in truth professor Mitt, i don't think i have much to add to this question specifically uh i'm more familiar with sentiment data than other sources of alternative data to tell you the truth okay matteo yeah, well, me too, because we produce a number of data sets based specifically on the processing of uh, specific information like uh, data, like uh, sentiment, but also corporate documents, uh, uh, 10Ks, early false transcripts, or market data. But uh, uh, so in general, I, 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 we don't cover directly other sources of alternative data. I mean, uh, questions that are typically asked are like uh, how not only to, to value a provider is uh, the reliability of the of the the length of the time series as we were saying before uh, if the algorithm i mean it's important that you it depends also if the algorithm is sort of descriptive or predictive i mean if you're trying to to give some predictions then you have to ensure that you're not did not do any overfitting uh, did not go in, uh, fall into any overfitting uh, pitfalls if you're doing a description, maybe it's important that you can ensure that there is kind of uh, the algorithm is being frozen at a certain time and there is no like uh, tweaking of the algorithms. But this, it, it really, I, I, I mean, I can give you an answer on the specific data sets, not on, on the overall uh, on the overall view. So maybe you have the you have a more general view on that. Yeah. So um, as I understand it correctly, it is about the source of alternative data, right? So. Um, my, my my last employer actually um, the the business that uh, you know that I was looking after here in Asia Pacific our job was actually trying to get new signals to people so now how now you know people say that this is the age of information but if you ask me this is the age of too much information which means there are so many providers coming up so many so many providers coming up and what will happen is these small providers then get acquired by like one of the big ones like S&P or Bloomberg or something. And but when it get a, when it gets acquired, 
then it gets commoditized, which means it becomes available for everybody, and it goes from alternative data to quasi-alternative data and then mainstream. So the real source of alternative data are these small new companies that find some innovative idea, find a new you know, source of information, raw information, and then clean it and massage it. So that's a lot of work. So it, if you're really looking for good alternative data, it's about looking out for these small little new firms that are trying to go to some niche and trying to monetize that. Yeah, so just an example. So somebody, people were looking at how many ships are parked, are passing through a particular port. Now, this might seem like a new thing, but this was monetized at least a dozen years back. And a small company started, did that, got acquired by a big company, and now it became mainstream. So the small companies that go on try to identify these things. So they are the ones, and if you spot them early on, if you become the first person to use it, then you're going to benefit a lot more. And that's what I would like to say. Yeah. I would like to add that there are some intermediaries coming up here. There are data aggregators like what we Quandl, who will look at all that is available and they will hand it on a plate to the end user or a team what they want, you know. So it is quite important. And there are other aggregators as well. Now, I would say we may also add uh, providers of uh, on aggregated data, of derived data. Uh, it's not necessarily from a source like uh, the number of ships in a port, but mathematically derived data for using some intelligence that is not available uh, uh, in order, Correct. like right. some proprietary yeah. modeling that generates yeah, yeah, some, yeah. Some, some stream of data, which can even go back to the past, uh, all the way to the past. This is, uh, in, in a sense, it's similar to what they call smart beta today, in a okay. sense. All right, so shall we move on to the next question? Okay, so uh, this is a very interesting question we have received on YouTube. Now, uh, so it is asked specifically to uh, Dr. Kashyap. So the question is, do you work with a country-specific approach, uh, also known as a uh, a tweet of a, a tweet of Trump might cause joy in U.S. and result in fear in Mexico. <laughs> uh, so yes, you know, look, um, the, you know, there are times, and th there's a lot of research being done on this now. Well, the markets are much more tightly linked now than 20 years back. Uh, but that being said, there are still some some data sets that will influence uh, you know, a particular country a lot more than other countries. And uh, a way to look about this is, see, when you talk about risk, you should try to break down the sources of risk. So one is you know, your country risk, right? So regulation will come into that. And you know, then the overall you know, interest rate risk which could go across different countries so you try to look at your different sources of risk and and then country is definitely one very good flavor of looking at it because you know at the end of the day what we are doing here is right we try to take the whole thing and digest something it's harder so we chop it up into pieces so country is one way to chop it and of course there's many many different ways of doing it and the more that you can think of you just look at it in a different way and you know it might give you some insights so yeah um, yeah, and then on to the others. As I anticipated, I have to leave. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm already late, sorry. And um, sorry, I thank you very much for hosting me. It was very interesting. And I, I'm fortunately you, happy. Oh, okay. Thank I must thank you, Matteo, on very short notice. I got him on Saturday and you agreed. And thank you very much. And we it's look forward. Yeah. And thank you. And a nice one. It was a pleasure also to meet the other panelists. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Matteo. Bye-bye. So while Matteo is going off on the question of America and Mexico, I had a very good joke about this, if I'm not, and that is, why doesn't Mexico want to uh, have athletic meetings there or the Olympics? Because and the answer is meant to be that because all their runners and if you like hurdle runners and so forth, have already gone to America. You see what I mean? Because of the barrier, 
you know, they've jumped over them and jumped through them and did everything else to get there. So that's the answer. Anyway, so next question. All right, so next question is by Patrick. So Patrick asks, what are you recommend? So what are your recommendations in preparation for this course? Is it wise to go into NLP or something else? Uh, yeah, I, I, I personally don't think it's necessary to, to go into this, uh, but maybe be, being comfortable with uh, Python as a programming language would, would help, right? Uh, being slightly com comfortable because I uh, generally produce some, some, some uh, hands-on content uh, and that person that already is already familiar with the language has less, uh, um, has an easier time understanding it. But apart from it, uh, I think uh, just not basic knowledge in, in finance, some basic knowledge in financial models. What do you think, uh, Rafael, Professor Mitchell? Yeah, I want to come in and say, first of all, let me tell you, in this course, Cristiano will be the prime mover. He's superb. He runs all the hands-on sessions. And as he said, you know, he has Jupyter Notebook and Python. So he's a, one of the important parts. However, about what is important uh actually we, we learned something in the first and second cohorts and one of that was that how would they have some of the alternative data that we're using it and indeed we have reached out to various providers who would give us some trial data and so that's one part of it but i think having access to data sources and not only a part of it, but listening to the way we are putting it together. That's, I don't necessarily say that's the best way, but it's a horses for courses. We are trying to create first a background called foundation lectures, and then use cases like that Ravi does or Matteo does, and they are going to give you examples where not only sentiment, but the alternative data have been exploited. So trying to get into the NLP for sentiment data is too narrow. So I would not recommend for people wanting to do the course to be narrow. It has to, it has more or less broadened out. So over to you, Ravi, now. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the preparation, right? So look, as uh, you know, Matthew and Professor Mitra know the course a lot better than me. I teach one module on like the, uh, on a tra particular trading strategy but uh, the, the only thing i would say is uh, preparation for any course there is one preparation that is you should be willing to participate you know please be very involved right because then you'll benefit a lot more and especially as i understand like mathe is going to do hands-on sessions for that those sort of things you know you bring your a game like please be very involved and participate and uh, i think that's the that's the main thing in terms of prerequisites now, I also want to thank the person that asked this question. So NLP, natural language processing, that's the word I was looking for, the AI-related word. So look, these things, um, again, they, it is a whole set of techniques that if you know something about it, that's wonderful, right? You you know, when you go through the scores, it'll add to it. But if you don't, that's okay too, because, you know, you will come here. So the key thing is, you know, wherever you are right now, the course will aim to take you one level higher. And that is the main goal. That is the main goal of this, right? So please come wherever you are. Be very prepared to participate, be involved, and uh, you know, good things will happen, as they say. So, Yeah, that's a very good comment, Ravi. I think participation is the most important. Uh, people in our courses, quite a few of them, looked at the, uh, or rather, listened to the recordings, but uh, that doesn't give the whole thing as you listen and interact with the speakers, if you like. So, okay. So I think we're coming up to our sort of time limit. Shall we have one final question? And then I would like to sure. check people for their interest. It's also the attendance has gone up to 100, come down to 66. And you can always send us email questions to each part, each faculty member separately or to all the faculty members for clarification. Okay, so last question, Kitish. Okay, so this is more of a career-oriented question. So uh, Shantanu asks, I am 
in my penultimate year of BSc CS program and uh, want to get a job into quantitative research analyst as a quantitative research analyst what should be my approach Oof. let's hear from the others i will give class um, you you, yeah, you are the, a player uh, sorry i was first trying to get uh, ravi because he was a player in this domain and became academic so we we'll used to give that yeah. and then christian and i'll give the last one yeah Shantanu, I want to tell you something here from my personal experience, because I think your question is, a, you know, is a very important one. I think that's the reason why everybody is doing these things, right? So Shantanu, you know, I was also in my penultimate year, yeah, when I was doing my undergrad, and then, um, you know, and then I got a job in a hedge fund, and at that time I did not know what a hedge fund was, you know, and I knew it was a finance company, and the my understanding of finance at that time was my father's brother used to work in a bank. He used to work in a state bank of India or one of those banks in India. And I thought, oh my God, what is this terrible job I have got? You know, I have to go and do this back debit credit. You know, what is this? You know, I thought it was, uh, it was very, I was, I was very not happy about getting this job. But only then later I ventured in, I did it. And then I realized, wow, this is a very fascinating field. It's really interesting. So, the thing is, you know, we cannot decide where we will end up, Shantanu. Yeah. But the skills we can develop. And that skills, it will help you not just in this particular field, but in many other fields. So you see, this field is evolving a lot. So now people talk about quantitative research, but that is now becoming fintech, right? So it's combining with technology a lot. And people are not able to even separate that right now. So I would say, uh, you know, as uh, Christian also mentioned, Python or these languages are very helpful in terms of manipulating data because there's more and more data sets being created. So you should get very familiar with that. And you should try to get a very good understanding of some of the mathematical concepts. So you should do these things. And, and the last but uh, very understated is that, uh, look, getting a job is, uh, is not an easy thing, right? A lot of people looking for jobs and stuff. So, you know, you should try to meet as many people as you can. And, you know, you never know where a door might open. So, but again, you should become someone that people want to hire. And then, you know, opportunities will come. And then, of course, you don't know where you will end up. But when the door opens for you, you should be ready to take it. So you should become that person that anybody will want to hire. And when the opportunity strikes, you can take it. So that's that's the thing I would say. Mr. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have much else to say on what Ravi said. I would suggest to not be afraid of mathematics, <laughs> to get your hands dirty in, in both programming and mathematics, I think. Uh, uh, if You might have a background in finance or you might have a background in a, in a STEM field, a computer science, engineering. Uh, it's, it's possible for both, uh, like a person with a background in STEM might want to learn more about financial concepts in finance, a bit more, although hedge funds sometimes look for people that do not have a, a financial background. <laughs> Specifically, I've seen this. And uh, a person from finance might want to, to get more familiar, acquainted with, uh, with especially uh, programming, computing, applied mathematics, some statistics, but not be afraid of math. Like go go uh, dev uh, develop some, some quality time to, to learn in it, uh, be it in academia or by yourself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to yeah. close it with my own life experience in some sense. I left India when I was 21, becoming an engineer in 1962. In those days, engineering was the most sought after profession. Now, now see how well that changed. So when I got to U UK and did my master's and PhD, I extracted myself from engineering, and in, indeed in UK, I didn't know then, but all the engineers were losing their jobs, being fired, et cetera, because things were being outsourced. So, but what became quite evident that computers was very good, computing, applied computing, going to, so I became, got into computer science, or rather from programming, uh, earlier, uh, if you like machines you know, market delay machines. Now then, that also changed from computing 
it's become the new world that is with maths and AI and machine learning. And as other people mentioned, one thing for sure, you must be well grounded in maths and put your all your effort into mathematics. And the, don't lose objectivity because commerce is also a field where people are often say, oh, it's so uh, you know boring to be uh, in accounting, but ultimately it's all about money, how you manage your money, how you manage your life. And so uh, what, I'm, what the message is, be cognizant of what is going right now and get into the profession as Ravi says, that opens the door for you. But hopefully in the new area of fund management or you know financial uh, domain. But we open to switch across. So that's my message on this, as in required by the world, uh, the way it moves. Okay. So let's hear from Shantanu. What did you think about these advisors? And we'll stop. I think uh, that would be difficult given the attendees cannot be promoted uh, as a panelist or speakers. But yeah, yeah, we'll definitely get in touch with him and uh, yeah, get the message across. Right. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. So, so thank, thank you very much for your interest and for your continued questions. And I thank my colleagues in the faculty for taking the time off and answering your questions. And thanks, Kitish, for organizing this whole night show. And thank you. Big and thanks to all of you. Yeah, yeah, big, big, big thanks for all of you. I mean, uh, it was very uh, short notice, uh, but like uh, there was some commitment that we have seen. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And uh, before I uh, end this session, I would like to say that uh, if you enjoyed this uh, session or entire Algo Trading Week, it's our birthday today, so it's our 11th anniversary. Just go out on our social media handles and wish us happy anniversary. That's with that said, uh, a big thank you to everyone for taking out your time and keep loving, keep supporting. I'll see you in the next session. Till then, uh, take care and uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Everybody, bye. take care. Bye bye.